you know, every day is, is a gift to me. And, uh, you know, something really strange happened um, a couple of years ago. Uh, the group ISIS or Daesh, they held a series of Westerners and they put them all in the orange suits like Guantanamo and put them on TV one after another after another, begging for their lives, pleading for their lives. And um, I was watching one and it was a young man called David Haynes, a Scottish aid worker who was born just maybe an hour from where I'm now living in Scotland. And he had a young daughter and I just thought, if, if there's any way that we can get him out of this situation. And I contacted um, ISIS. I made contact through uh, an Arab journalist. And I thought, they say that they're Islamic. Well, let's see just how Islamic they are. And I went and offered something called an Islamic intercession, where you intercede on behalf of another um, Muslim. And uh, I interceded on behalf, well, not on behalf of another Muslim, but I interceded on behalf of David Haynes. And I said, I will swap places with him. And the, the offer went to them. And if they had been an ounce of, Islam, you know, if, if there had been just the slightest bit of um, Islam in their hearts, they would have been duty bound to have accepted this intercession, but they didn't. And um, unfortunately, uh, a week or so later, David Haynes was executed. And it's a story that um, hasn't really been told before because we just didn't you know after david was executed it was too late you know it was there was no point to the story but i'm telling it now because um it it just exposes isis for what they are which is a gang of godless bastards basically i'm sorry for the language but that is there is no Islam in them. There is nothing in their heart. Um, and uh, because I'm not afraid of things, um, I was able to make that, uh, that offer. Because his daughter will now never know her father. And that my daughter is now in her 20s, she's a young woman, she's got her life, and she's, I'm very proud of her. But that poor little girl, um, David Haynes' daughter, uh, she, she will never know her father. He will now never, never know his your daughter. And it was just, it really, um, you know, I really felt for him out of all of the hostages and uh, you know it it, uh, it didn't work and some people said what on earth did you think you were going to do and I said well I thought I might have been able to talk my way out of that situation but um, you know now we'll never know and um, it, it's quite obvious that uh, this ISIS group is, is just uh, anything but Islamic. I was working as the chief reporter for the Sunday Express newspaper and after the horrific events of 9-11 I was sent to Pakistan and that is where more than 3,000 international journalists had assembled as the drums of war were beating uh, between Washington and Afghanistan and uh, so I was there for a couple of weeks 
and the pressure I felt was on me to get a story that nobody else had got. And so the idea was born um, to sneak into Afghanistan wearing the all enveloping blue burqa, the chadol, and I would uh, be there for two or three days looking and, and seeing what life was like under the ruling Taliban. And 15 years later, it sounds like a crazy thing to do, but I did it. And it worked very well for two days. And then on the way back, uh, I made the journey by donkey. This donkey just bolted and I fell off. I don't know if I fell off or I was pulled off by a passing Taliban soldier. All I remember was hitting the ground and um, as I pulled myself up, I'm looking straight into the eyes of this Taliban soldier. And he was shouting at me because he had seen that I had a camera and the cameras were banned under the Taliban. So I'm looking at him through the grill of my burqa and when I got home, some of my girlfriends said to me, what was going through your mind at that precise moment when you realised you'd been captured by the Taliban? And I said, well, for a nanosecond, and it was a nanosecond, I'm looking through the grill straight into the eyes of this soldier. And I thought, my goodness, you are gorgeous. He had these amazing green eyes that were made famous by a girl in the front pages of the National Geographic magazine. He had high cheekbones, a wild mane of hair and a beard with a life of its own. He really did look quite spectacular, but that was all for a nanosecond. And then I realised, you know, this is, he's going to kill me. And I could see that he wanted the camera, so I took the camera off and handed it to him. And then I stepped back, closed my eyes, waited for 10 seconds, which is a long time when you think you're going to be shot. And I opened my eyes again to see why he hadn't shot me. And he'd gone off. He had gone off to the donkey trader and he wanted to know who did you sell the donkey to? And then he would find out who was responsible um, for bringing this woman in with a camera. And I realised at that point that I could get away because he didn't realise that I was a Westerner. So I just then um, looked and saw another group of people and, and with three women wearing burqas as well. And I just thought, I can get away. And so I joined on to the end of this, uh, this group and walked away with them. But when I looked back, I saw that the soldier had got my two guides. And I continued walking, thinking, well, you know, we said if anything goes wrong, it's every man, woman for themselves. And so I thought they'll understand why I'm bailing out. And then I looked back again and uh, one of the guides was slapped across the face and a crowd of angry men had gathered around. And I realised that I couldn't leave them behind. So I turned back round and I'm cursing myself as I'm walking back thinking, what are you doing? You know, that this will ensure that you're getting arrested. And I'm thinking, well, you, you can't leave the guides behind. So I walked through and they were surrounded by a crowd of Afghan men and I tried to push my way through and I was thrown back. You know, this was man's business. It had nothing to do with a woman. And again, I pushed my way in and again, I was thrown back. So in the end, um, I took my burqa off. I was wearing a shalwa kameez, the, the long dress and the trousers. And I said, well, somebody let me through. And suddenly everybody froze. It's, where did this Westerner come from? Who is she? What does she want? You know, and, and, um, and they just parted. And I walked up to the Taliban soldier 
And as I was walking up to him, his jaw had just dropped. He's thinking, where has this Westerner come from? And then I threw a quick look at my guides because I thought they would be looking back thinking, what a noble gesture. And they looked back as if to say, yeah, we were in trouble before. Now we're in serious trouble. And I realised that this was the worst thing that I could have done. So I went to the soldier and demanded he give me the camera. And he just started screaming. And a car was brought and we were all bundled into a car. And then we were taken off at speed to the intelligence headquarters in Jalalabad. On the route to Jalalabad, uh, something was agitating the soldier and he stopped the car and ordered me onto this raised piece of ground. And then he went off over the, the hill and I'm standing there thinking, you know, why is he doing this? And then I looked around and saw lots of um, rocks and stones and pebbles on the ground. And I just thought, oh my goodness, it's the stoning corner. I'm going to be stoned. That's what these people do. They're evil and brutal. That's what George Bush and Tony Blair tell us. And they wouldn't lie, would they? <laughs> so I'm standing there thinking that I'm going to have this fate far worse than any death. And suddenly the soldier comes back and he has with him um, another woman wearing a burqa. And he didn't have a crowd of people with him for the stoning. She came round and she turned me round and she started frisking me to um, see if I had any weapons on me. And this is obviously what was concerning them, that I might have been carrying a bomb or a gun or something. And it was really strange when you consider that rather than just search me on the spot, he had gone off to find a woman to search me because he didn't want to touch me. So, you know, that, that was quite, um, quite interesting. And um, so then we were taken to the intelligence headquarters and people were firing their Kalashnikovs and, and uh, shouting death to the American spy and uh, Zindabad Osama, which was long life to Mr. Bin Laden. And it, it was a really terrifying time. And when I sat down, they gave me a pen and paper, or a pencil and paper, and told me to write down um, anything and everything that would prove that I was the journalist that I said I was. And they were convinced that I was an American spy and I said I'm British and they're saying you're trying to disguise your accent. Of course I come from the north of England near the Scottish borders and I said we don't all talk like the Queen and you know this is my northern accent. I come from the north we're hated by the people in the south and they liked that idea because it's something that uh, I think they could identify with. And um, so it, it was uh, six days in the intelligence headquarters in Jalalabad. And then they moved me up to Kabul and locked me up with um, a group of other Westerners. These were... Um, Christians who had been accused of trying to convert Muslims to um, Christianity. During the, the, the whole incarceration, um, I was interrogated by some very scary looking men with great big black turbans and big black beards. And uh, the guards, you know, everything that they wore was um, dusty or torn or ripped. And uh, one day um, I was told that I had a very important visitor and that I must be respectful. And I just thought, oh, you know, more questions. And it was, no, this is a very important man. You really must be respectful and please don't be rude. 
because um, he is to be respected. And I'm thinking, who is this person? And I'm thinking, is it Mullah Omar, uh, who was the then spiritual leader of the Taliban? And maybe it's Osama bin Laden. And the interpreter just said, just show respect and remember that I am the one who has to translate your words. And, you know, these people scare me, so they should scare you. And so he went out and about 15 minutes later, there was a knock on the door and I uh, went to open it. Although I was the prisoner, they had given me the key. So I unlocked the door and there standing in front of me was a man who made my blood run cold. Because for six days, I had avoided talking about religion and there in front of me was this cleric. And um, he had this immaculate white gown that went right the way to the floor. The Taliban, their trousers were above their ankles. This man's gown went right to the floor. Um, he had an ivory uh, turban, quite a modest beard by Afghan standards, light brown eyes. And there was something about his skin. And I'm looking quite closely at him and thinking, is he wearing makeup? You know, do, do the Taliban wear cosmetics? And I'm looking because he had a shine on his face. And I couldn't understand it because there were no lights in the room, but the light was coming out of him rather than on him. And I'm, I'd never seen this before and it really freaked me out. And, and then he sort of glided in and sat down and um, I sat opposite him with the translator in the middle. And um, I found out later when I spoke to my first Muslim audience, when I said he had this light coming out of him, they were saying, this is the Nur. And the Nur is a natural light that emanates from someone's skin um, when they're considered very pious and very holy. And it's just a natural shine that comes out. And I have seen it since, but never to this degree and intensity. So he sat down, he invited me to embrace Islam. He asked me what my religion was. And I said I couldn't make such a life-changing decision while I was in prison, but... I said, if you let me go, I promise I will read your Quran, your holy book, and I will read up on Islam. And he smiled and he didn't say anything more and he got up and he just glided on out again. And then the translator, Hamid, came running back and he said, you're going, you're going home on a red crescent plane. And this, you know, I punched the air and congratulated myself for having dealt so cleverly with this cleric but indeed I was um, moved up to Kabul and put in a, a prison um, that really did reflect uh, the poverty and, and misery in Afghanistan at, uh, at that time. It was dreadful. Everything that you would imagine a third world prison to be. Um, but uh, even though they held on to other Westerners, they released me against all the odds. And uh, even after the war had started, and, and um, on October the 8th um, in 2001, I, I was handed over to the Pakistan authorities, uh, Britain, uh, the British representatives didn't bother to turn up and uh, I was handed over and um, it was only on the point of walking across no man's land to get to the Pakistan border that I realised um, that I was safe, that I was free and that during those 11 days in the hands of the Taliban they had treated me with a courtesy and respect that I and nobody else had expected. People were furious because the war had started 
and nobody wanted to hear how nice or courteous these people had been because we were dropping bombs on them and you can't drop bombs on nice people. So I was sort of bundled out of the, the way and, and um, you know, I, uh, I used the time to write a book. <laughs> I started reading the Quran almost immediately. Part of it was because I'd given a promise, but part of it was that as someone covering the Middle East and Asia, I realised that I knew nothing about Islam and by observing the Taliban it was quite clear to me that Islam was a way of life. It wasn't just something that they picked up and put down on Friday prayers. It, w it was uh, how they ate, how they drank, how they slept, how they behaved. Everything that they did was within an Islamic context. So I just thought if, if I'm to do any accurate reporting on the Muslim world, on the Arab world, I really need to know more about this faith. So it was a, an academic exercise, but it turned into a spiritual journey for me. Um, what a lot of people didn't realize was that I was already a practicing Christian. And journalists freak out when you mention religion and uh, most newsrooms are secular. I had got away with uh, being a practicing Christian uh, for many years. None of my friends knew, and I happened to think that religion is a private affair between you and God. Um, but I started reading the Quran. It was very easy because the similarities between Islam and Christianity are quite obvious. And so when people say, you made a great leap of faith, I didn't. Um, I, I happen to think Christianity is a, is a good springboard to Islam. Um, but it wasn't a great leap of faith. I'm still praying to the same God. Um, I still believe in God. Uh, Jesus is very strong in Islam. Uh, his influence and the respect people have for him is incredibly high and all the other significant prophets in Islam are also well known to Christians so it was quite a surprise for me and then I there was the exception of um, Muhammad peace be upon him and I started reading about him and you know this is an incredible man when you consider that um, in the 7th century he began to bring a religion to the world which now has more than a billion followers. I think it's 1.2 billion followers. And he, his name is known uh, universally. He's probably the best known uh, human being in the world today. Even the atheists, the secularists, um, people who don't follow Islam will have heard of Muhammad. So it's it's uh, so I was reading about him as well, and about two years later, I ended up embracing Islam, which caused outrage in in parts of my family, in parts of my friends, in parts of my profession. Um, I know that other people who've had encounters with the Taliban have not survived or tell horrific stories. Quite why I was treated as well as I was, I'm really not sure. Although shortly after I was released, a French journalist was arrested um, who worked for Paris Match and his partner contacted me and I said, if he's been held by the same Taliban who held me, you have nothing to worry about. And um, he was released, fine and well, and uh, not too bad for the experience. And he also said that he had been treated um, well. I think, you know, it's with every movement or every group, um, there are some bad apples. And uh, th this, uh, this group, um, you know, t 
treated me um, as best as I could, uh, you know, expect to be treated under the circumstances. Once I got used to the idea that I was going to die, um, that I seemed to accept that quite calmly. However, I was afraid that I would be tortured. That was a much bigger fear than the thought of death. Death, I could deal with. You know, you're put up against a wall, you're shot, and it's over. Torture is something different. And this is what concerned me. And I thought, I, I've got no information to give them. I've got nothing of importance to tell them. They will think I'm this American GI Jane who can give them information. I can give them nothing. They will think, oh, she's incredibly brave and she's not telling us anything because she's been trained to, when in fact I had nothing to... And this is what really concerned me. And this is one of the reasons, you know, that... Um, that I wrote a book later about torture and, and does it work? Because I just thought, what do people do in those circumstances? You know, let's be brutally frank. If I had been a prisoner of the Americans, I would have been waterboarded, I would have been abused, I would have been punched and kicked and knocked around, I would have been hanging from walls, I would have been standing up, listening to rock music at a million decibels all night. And, and I, you know, I would have been tortured or enhanced interrogation techniques. One day when I was uh, visiting the bathroom, I found an old razor blade and I hid that in a bar of soap because I thought, if they start to torture me, I will stop their fun and I will kill myself. And and this is, you know, as, as, as strange as it seems, and I'm not being macho or brave or, you know, and in fact it would probably be a coward's way out, death was preferable to torture. And um, that's what I'd worked out in my head. So I just wanted to accelerate uh, this, um, you know, my demise. I just wanted it over and done with. And of course, as any prisoner will tell you, you have no control. The only control you have is to go on hunger strike. And that, that was the only control that I could exert, which sounds a bit crazy because you're harming yourself. But I went on hunger strike. People say that I was kidnapped by the Taliban. I actually wasn't. I was arrested by them because I had entered their country illegally without a passport, without a visa, without any documentation. And they said to me, you were a very bad woman. Uh, what would happen if we came to Britain without a visa? without papers, without a passport. And I thought they, they would be arrested and they would be locked up. So uh, yes, I, I was arrested um, initially for entering the country illegally and without documentation or a visa. And uh, I was also suspected of being a spy. Um, I was guilty of one, not the other. I, I wasn't a spy, but um, they released me on humanitarian grounds in the end. My initial plan was to find out what life was like for ordinary men and women under the Taliban. And it had gone so well. I said to my guides as we were making our way out, I said, we'll go to Kandahar next week which of course is the spiritual home of the Taliban. But um, I did find out some interesting things. I found out that uh, girls' schools did operate under the Taliban. Girls were educated, uh, not on a Western curriculum. They didn't, they rejected that from a lot of the charities that were coming in that wanted to uh, 
educate the girls with a Western curriculum. They so they were um, there were girls' schools. Um, Tony Blair said these people are so evil they won't even let children fly kites. I asked them about that and they said of course people can fly kites but not in the towns and the cities because they get the, the strings wrapped around power cables, they pull at them and uh, they cut through the power cables and they get electrocuted. And I said, but how can you get electrocuted with some paper and string? Because, you know, I used to fly kites as a child. And they laughed and they said, in this part of the world, the kite flying is done with a wire which is dipped in glue, which is wrapped in powdered glass. And the aim is to cut your opponent's kite until there is only one kite left flying and it, it's like a competition and they said and that's why we stopped people from flying kites and also they were running across rooftops and getting so excited they forgot that the, the, you know there was no roof space and they would fall off the roof and uh, injure themselves or even worse so they said you can fly the kites in the countryside but not in towns and cities, which makes common sense. But Tony Blair spun it in such a way. And then I thought, well, when I got back home, if you go around any housing estate in Britain, you will see signs, no ball games, no skateboarding, no skating. And you could turn around and say, the British government is so evil it won't let its children play ball games and show all these images one after another. It's propaganda. The Banyan Buddhas, um, two or three of them were destroyed. It was a very juvenile, childish act of uh, petty uh, cultural vandalism. Um, and we were told all the Buddhas have been destroyed. There are hundreds, literally hundreds of Buddhas in Bamyan. They did destroy two or three, and I said, why did you do this? And I was told our people were starving, uh, people were digging under the snow to eat grass, uh, we were cut off from the rest of the world. The aid was drying up uh, that we were receiving. And all people cared about were these rocks. That's what they called the statues. And so we blew them up. We thought, you want the rocks? You can have them. And so we blew them up. And it, it was a disgraceful act of vandalism. But they said... The Europeans, the rest of the West, were trampling on the bodies of starving Afghans to protect some rocks, and our people were starving to death. And you can sort of feel the anger. You can never justify that sort of vandalism, but you can see where the anger comes from that led to them blowing up um, these magnificent statues. It wasn't a case of we're Muslims, we hate statues, we're blowing them up. There was a lot of um, bad feeling on the way. And I suppose if your people are starving and you get uh, the European community coming to you and say, we want to talk about these statues, you know, don't you realise the importance of them, the cultural significance of them? And they're saying, our people are starving. Yeah, well, never mind about that. Can we just talk about the statues? You can see where the anger was coming from. My professional life did change out of necessity. I could no longer work as an undercover journalist because my picture had been around every newspaper when I was um, captured, you know, I became the story which 
no journalist really wants. So I had to reinvent and uh, go into humanitarian reporting. I then went out into television and radio. I then um, expanded into writing books and, and I've you know written some books now. I have, um, I miss in some ways my old job, which was undercover journalism, um, but it's forced me to go with a much wider remit. And I'm now working with somebody on a play um, and uh, I, I've, because I've got into the humanitarian field, um, I'm going to a lot of conferences and making speeches and uh, so it, it's opened up all sorts of other possibilities. I dabbled in politics for a while, um, but the sleaze in Westminster, it was such a turn off that uh, that was one of the reasons that I moved to Scotland and, you know, very active to try and get independence for Scotland because I think that that is a country that um, would more reflect my views and is more interested in ethical foreign policies and more interested in promoting people ahead of profit. So... Uh, I, um, I wasn't a bad person before I converted to Islam, but I just think I'm probably more productive now than I used to be. But I'm essentially, you know, still, still the same person that um, that I was before nine eleven.